Um, lots of familiar faces. This is, um, it's really great to be here. Uh, this is the first time actually that I'm here as uh, a representative of the new Atlassian Stride product that we just launched in the new communication application. It's pretty cool, check it out. Um, it is, one thing that I'm not doing for the first time is representing Jitsi, uh, because still um, Stride Video is heavily, heavily integrating Jitsi, an open source project suite, uh, and a video bridge and um, a conferencing application. This is what we use to build our video, app, video experience in Stride. So um, as video engineers in the Stride team and, and in Jitsi, uh, one of our primary responsibilities is to make sure that we deliver the best quality video um, to users, to our users. And what that means when you're dealing with video transport is that you have to be prepared to react to network conditions. That means that when you have a multi-party call, you have to be able to drop people and not send them uh, when the conditions don't allow for it. And then you have to be able to ramp all the way back up to uh, full HD when, um, uh, when the problems clear up. So um, we've been working on that for a while. Uh, we have a bunch of things already in place. And um, it's actually something that we're quite proud of. But that's not what I'm going to talk about today. Our, my story today starts with a call where a user reached out to us and complained that she had had this horrible experience where she was degraded to audio and it was just so bad um, and asked us if we could look at what was happening there. So uh, we did. At a first glance, things didn't seem that surprising. In fact, we had a call where for some amount of time, two people had exchanged video at 2,500 kilobits, which is about what you do when you're sending 720p. And then something had happened, and the quality dropped all the way down to an audio-only call. This isn't immediately cause for thinking, wait, there's something wonky there, because that's just what you do when congestion happens. That's what you want to happen when your network doesn't have the capacity to send everything out. And before I continue with this story, I'd like to make sure that everyone is on the same page as far as congestion goes, and, and about how congestion control works. So the idea is pretty odd. Uh, you have two things communicating. One of them is sending video with some quality. Then the receiving endpoint would say, hey, there's something wrong going on. And then the sender would say, OK, in that case, I'm, trying, I'm going to try and send you less, whether it's less pixels, more compressed, whatever. They're going to try and adapt based on the feedback from the receiver. Now, um, initially, if you were Working on real-time communication in the pre-WebRTC days, you would probably remember that most of that was happening based on packet loss. And, and this is still in WebRTC today. The Google congestion control algorithm has this bit that says, if you have more than 8% packet loss, you aggressively decrease between 2 and 8. You sort of keep car course and uh, then be below 2%, feel free to ramp up your streaming. So this is still there. But it's obviously insufficient, because when you start experiencing packet loss, you know, shit has already hit the fan at that point. Think bad things are happening, so you'd want to react much earlier. And the good news is that you can. Um, here's how this works. So when you have a sender streaming out a bunch of packets to a receiver, uh, they traverse a number of network boxes, NAT boxes, access points, routers. And what all of these have in common is that they would take packets, they would put them on a queue if they have to, and then when they're ready, they're going to send them on uh, on their way. And this is generally fine. You don't notice, uh, don't even notice the existence of a queue as long as it's small. But when you start sending more to the router that it can stream out, the queue starts filling up until it's eventually full, and you start dropping packets. So. Um, that's where packet loss occurs in congestion scenarios, and that's what you'd want to avoid. It's actually, the idea about avoiding it is pretty neat. Um, if you look at this, the receiver here can look at the incoming packets and look at their timestamps. In the case of RTP, that could be RTP timestamps or RTP header extension up send times, whatever. They can look at that and say, hey, I'm getting these packets at a rate that's slower than what they were sent with. So I need to tell the sender that this is happening. It used to be that Chrome and the WebRTC implementation was primarily doing that with REMB messages. Today, it's more fine-grained feedback on what exactly happened when exactly packets arrived. The important thing is that in both cases, it's the receiver sending an indication about what's going on to the sender, and then the sender adapting the bit rate. So in this case, 
Um, it's going to drop down the bitrate that it's sending, that's going to empty the queues, and things are going to go back to normal. This generally works really well. In fact, it works so well that if you've read one of the latest Costats I.O. reports, the vast majority of calls on WebRTC have no packet loss whatsoever, because we're, most of the time, these implementations are able to react to congestion very, very fast. Now, unfortunately, the vast majority is not all, and in some cases, still packet loss happens. Now, this brings us back to the call where our user complained and how we were initially thinking, ah, oh, one more person with a bad connection that's complaining uh, about things that are not our responsibility. So this was just the first glance. Then we looked um, at this a little bit more and we saw this. This was packet loss happening in that call. And the first thing you notice is, yes, at about the same time that we saw the disruption event in the um, throughput graph, we have the same thing reflected here in the packet loss graph. What's really weird is that, yes, we saw packet loss, we dropped the bit rate, but then the packet loss remained. In fact, it was pretty wild for something that was audio only. So we did something, we sacrificed this, we, we made this huge sacrifice of, of quality, and it didn't solve our problem. So it sounded like we weren't doing the right thing in this case. And that wasn't the only case. In fact, we went through our data and we saw tons and tons of other examples where we would have a drop in the bit rate and that wouldn't seem to resolve the issues that are happening. So um, basically, we're talking about a case where we are solving the wrong problem. We were solving a problem with, that has to do with capacity and what we're experiencing is a problem with reliability. Now, the good news is, that just as we have solutions for capacity problems, we have solutions for um, reliability problems, and, and they consist in overprotecting the information, the data that you send. Um, there, has, there have been a number of algorithms that exist, uh, mechanisms that let you do that. Uh, one of my favorites, and one that's supported by WebRTC, is forward error correction. You can do it differently uh, for um, audio and video, but the way that WebRTC does it for video is, pretty similar to the RAID 5 mechanism. Uh, for those who are not familiar, basically every few packets, you're going to add a packet of parity information so that if you lose any packet of data, you can look at this and uh, use it together with XOR it together with the, um, the rest of the data and uh, recreate the packet that got lost. Now, the really cool thing about forward error correction is that you can control how aggressive it is. You can say, uh, send, when you're feeling confident, you can send one forwarder correction packet every, I don't know, 60 packets. Or when you think that things are bad, you can just basically duplicate every packet of data with a packet of forwarder correction information. So that's good. Well, now, you, we have a solution. It's even supported by WebRTC. It's supported by things like Jitsi Video Bridge. But here's the problem. We have two different solutions that are not really compatible with each other. In fact, they're quite the opposite because with congestion control, you drop your bit rate. With forward error correction, you're sort of ramping up because you're adding more stuff on the wire. So it's pretty hard to make them work efficiently together. Um, this is not a new problem. In fact, uh, loss differentiation algorithms have been a pretty popular research topic ever since the early days of Wi-Fi. And there have been a number of algorithms out there uh, that addressed this problem. Uh, unfortunately, however, we didn't find any that looked very practical to us because most of them were trying to solve TCP issues or didn't really care about the uh, real-time constraint of communication or were using um, information from the 802.11 Mac layer that we didn't really have available in a conferencing server like Jitsi Video Bridge or in a JavaScript application. So uh, we felt that we needed something else uh, we needed a way to be able to tell, are we having a capacity problem or are we having a reliability problem? And this is where we got introduced to, to TensorFlow. Um, I'm assuming most people here are aware of TensorFlow, but for those who are not, it's this amazing tool that lets you experiment with a ton of machine learning algorithms. Um, you get to write your, um, your own scenarios and experiments in whatever language you choose whatever, Python, Java, uh, a few other popular ones. 
Uh, this is an example of, of what we did to, uh, to train our neural network. Uh, it's a pretty neat tool. Now, what we wanted to do is have a neural network that we're able to use real time, and at a point where we're about to drop our bit rate, we're able to feed it a number of things, say jitter, loss, obviously, RTT, but also misordering information because, you know, in spite of common knowledge, people keep repeating stuff like, uh, yeah, Wi-Fi is very lossy, Wi-Fi is very lossy, but the truth is that with Wi-Fi, you actually have a reliability mechanism at the 802.11 Mac layer, so you have retransmissions there, and the first impact that you're going to see of interferences for Wi-Fi, for example, is not really loss, but it's misordering, and now you're going to start hitting much, much sooner than, than packet loss. So we wanted to take all of this, and feed it to a neural network and get an indication, a classification real time that tells us whether this, is, uh, this looks like a capacity or a reliability problem. Now, the issue is that, um, so we have a neural network and, and we have all this data, but we don't really know what those codes were made on. We don't know anything about the environment. How do you train that neural network to recognize stuff? And what we did is we decided to do the following. And by the way, this is still very much work in progress, but what we thought we'd do is go through all of our calls, look for all the events where drops in the bit rate happened, and then try to, s to isolate those where it, this didn't seem to actually solve anything. That packet loss problems and, and, and jitter and um, misordering continued to occur even after the fact. And obviously, the, the tricky thing is that we want to be able to do that here before the drop. We want to feed these parameters at that point and ask how likely is it that this is a congestion thing versus uh, a reliability issue. And um, we did a ton of experiments. We're still doing many, um, but the results are looking pretty encouraging. So in this case, we are uh, training a net that w where we uh, um, were able to achieve at about 85% of classification accuracy. I'm going to talk a little bit more in a second about this, but here's the result. Now, in, in our lab test, um, we have this um, traditional four people um, video uh, in an environment with loss. And by the way, thanks to our friends from video for uh, providing that video to the community. It's, it's really useful for testing. So um, we have this test. This is what happens when you introduce loss uh, without, with, with the traditional algorithms that exist today, you know, things just go bad. And then if instead, in that situation, you try and overprotect your packets, well, this is what you get in exactly the same environment. And yes, there are still problems here and there, but the quality is just overwhelmingly different. Now, um, there's still a lot of work to do. Uh, for example, uh, from the remaining 15% that uh, are basically false positives for us, about 8 9% are cases where we fail to recognize um, mostly environments and we uh, still react as if we're handling congestion, which is not much of a problem because we're not making things any worse than they were before. But there are also about, there's also about 5 6% where we're mistakenly uh, uh, taking congestion to mean a, a lossy environment and we're ending up crappifying stuff, basically. Uh, so that's still something to work at, but so far, um, all, of our, all of our work with this has been so uh, encouraging that uh, we're really looking forward to talking about it more next year and hopefully, and obviously providing it to the community through the uh, GT Open Source Suite. Thank you very much. <laughs>